everyone and welcome back to La Cancha. And this World Cup has been so beautiful. It's thrown up so many surprises. Is that more twist in terms than a Tootsie Roll? For me, this World Cup has memories of what's happened in 2004 in the Champions League. And we're going to start with the beauty of what happened on Saturday. Unfortunately, Cristiano Ronaldo couldn't do his... So, yep, he couldn't do that. So, Lumi, you're on the spot. What went wrong for your boy, Cristiano? What went wrong? Um, it's hard to say, but uh, definitely didn't play well on the day. I think they created enough chances to possibly win, but credit to Morocco, man. They, they stuck in, they got stuck in, even could have won, could have gotten an extra goal at the end there. But uh, credit to them. I think <clears throat> on the balance of play, probably should have gone to extra time at least. If not for the goalkeeping error um, from Portugal's goalkeeper, he really shouldn't have to come out that far. But yeah, Mor- Morocco deserve it. Like on the, uh, yeah, they 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 put on you know a show. Uh, well, at least they were very you know like very diligent in their approach and stuck to their guns and got the goal held on and yeah it's definitely a massive uh you know achievement for them yeah yeah and i'm gonna talk more about that morocco angle and every anyone can feel free to jump into this conversation because as we can see on the screen here and sorry for our listeners we're gonna describe some stats like morocco had more expected goals um they didn't play with more of the ball portugal had by far by far the amount of possession. And the Moroccan coach said it, this is a style of Choloismo. This is a Diego Simeone style. He's going to defend, not do with the ball. And that has worked well for Morocco because they've not conceded many goals. In fact, they've only conceded you know, an own goal. And they keep getting the job done. And Mikhail, I want to talk to you about them because you were the only person who gave Morocco a chance in this panel. And why was that? Um, particularly what they showed against Spain, I think just Spain didn't have any clear cut chances on goal. And I thought based off of how, um, Portugal would have to try to break them down, it would be somewhat similar. Um, turns out that was the case. I mean, I still thought, don't get me wrong. I still thought Portugal would win, but, um, what's the, it's, it's interesting, this Morocco team, how organized the players are. It's like individually, they each know what they're doing in terms of like their defensive structure. It's You have um, Amrabat, who's just been, one, I mean, he's been like probably the best defensive midfielder in the competition with Brozovic from Croatia. So essentially what you have there is you have two kind of midfielders in front of him, but those midfielders essentially jump to kind of press individually and then they'll kind of retreat back to their formation and like teams are finding that really difficult to break down essentially and you have the wingers as well that are kind of blocking passing lanes to just make things really difficult to get the ball out wide it it is really remarkable what they're doing it is and it's remarkable and it's for african football because this is the first time we've had an african team or an Arab team, if you want to uh, categorize Morocco that way in the semifinals. And this is something that we waited since 2010 for, and it's finally happened now. And I don't think any of us would have suspected that it would be Morocco that would do it. No, not at Yeah. No, not at all. It it is still incredible. Like, I mean, I, I don't have any words to say, essentially, like, I mean, just don't forget the group stage, too. They, you know, drew, drew, drew against Croatia, who finished finalist four years ago. They beat Belgium 2-0, who was a semi-finalist four years ago. And they beat Canada quite kind, relatively comfortably. And Canada finished top of the CONCACAF qualifiers. So, you know, with beating Spain and Portugal, too, these aren't just easy games by any means. Yeah, and the question comes to, come to your mind, can they... Can they go all the way? They've got three issues defensively with players. There's three starting 
you know, their left back and two center backs, Mazraoui from Bayern, uh, Aguirre and Saiz in the last game, um, yeah. went out. And I don't think either of them are going to be able to play. Could be wrong. Yeah. I think that would just be really difficult to try to fill those spaces in. No, it, it, it will be for sure. I have my doubts. I, I mean, I would not be surprised, <laughs> I guess. It's just based off of what they've given. But, yeah, it seems it seems quite pessimistic. Yeah, it really is. And Oscar, I want to talk to you about Yusef and a series on our screen. And he's a player I made fun of. <laughs> before it's not the just you. Today. <laughs> I, I said Spain shouldn't be worried about Yusuf Benasiri, but it turns out maybe they should have, <laughs> given the goal he scored against Portugal, the lead he made, the Cristiano Ronaldo sort of lead. Yeah, 2.75 meters in the air is insane. <laughs> but yeah, um, as great as the leap and the take of the header was, you have to look at Diogo Costa and ask what he was doing. Because... With that, without that mistake, that mistake ultimately is what sent Portugal out. Yeah. And when you look at it with Diego Costa making that um, terrible mistake, on the opposite side, we saw Bono again, who was quite crucial. He made some mm -hmm. really key saves. Uh, I think Joe Felix had one shot that was like very close to going into the net, and Bono mm -hmm. was there again. Yeah. And it just shows the difference between what a goalkeeper, a good goalkeeper, can make in such a game like this. Yeah, but no, uh, I think the best save was that one from Felix that Ronaldo laid back off to him with the left foot. And yeah, he, Bono has had a supremely strong tournament. Like you said, the only goal they've considered has been an own goal. And I was looking at the stats of Morocco since, um, I hope I don't mispronounce this, um, <laughs> <laughs> since Regari came in. They've won, they've been unbeaten in all of his games, and the only goal they've conceded has been that own goal. So this wow. goes even before the World Cup to how not just a great goalkeeper is keeping them alive in the tournament, but a great defense. Yeah, a great defense that like most of us like a lot of these defenders, apart from maybe Akimi and Mazwari, they don't really play for like the top top teams in Europe. Mm -hmm. And like yeah. I, I believe size used to be at Wolves before. Yeah. And a couple of the goalkeepers, they don't play for the Real Madrid, the Bayern Munichs of the world. I'm yeah. sorry, the defenders. And it just shows how good a system can be in getting the team further into a tournament. Exactly. Like we said, Masrari and um, Aguero were injured from the Spain game. But I thought El Yamik and Ati Atala came in and did really good jobs at centre-back and left-back, respectively. Yeah. So... Yes, I know it's going to be difficult against France without most of their starters, but it seems like whoever comes in can just do a great job. Yeah, and it's like they've already beaten one of their conquerors slash neighbors, another neighbor, one of be the second conqueror in France. <laughs> uh, Technically, it's three. <laughs> it's three, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they can go for a trifecta. Uh, Olivia, I'm going to go back to you and talk about Portugal because... Where do they go from here? After the Switzerland game, we're all super hyped about them. They look like a team that could go all the way. Now Cristiano Ronaldo, he's gone. Like, tell us about Cristiano Ronaldo's impact on the national team in general and where do you see Portugal picking up from this? I mean, they do. Okay, in terms of Cristiano Ronaldo, I don't think he would try his very best maybe to show up at the, you know, like the Euros. You know, um, coming up maybe in two years, I think. He's going to try and, like, you know, still be around for that. But I don't see if he's going to be stuck in, a, you know, um, Saudi Arabia. Or is it um, the team that was kind of looking to get him or something like that? Like, I don't know how much competitive club for he's going to play between now and then to warrant being called up to the national team. So they do have a lot of talent. You know, Liao coming on. Uh, Jao Felix will probably be stepping more as well, like as a you know as a more senior member of the team. Fernandez has been relatively consistent. I mean, compared to everyone else in the team, very consistent performer for them. So they still have like you know, uh, they still have you know like a bright future, I would say. Um, yeah, they just have to move on from Ronaldo, which obviously as the greatest player ever. It's not like a hyperbole to say so. Um, 
yeah, he it, it, it just has to pick themselves up. Um, I, I wonder if they would move on from the coach. I yeah. think they should because I also feel like uh, uh, he's, his approach might be just a bit like stale now, at least in terms of the Portuguese team and just kind of give get like a fresh perspective in the team and someone I think who would also take chances on the younger guys. I mean, credit to him. He did sort of bench Ronaldo for you know, the last game, which obviously um, – What's his name? Ramos came in and you know showed, showed, showed up on the world stage. So yeah, we're just to see. But yeah, I think the the future is bright for them. Yeah. And why didn't Ramos have an impact, similar impact in this game compared to the game against Switzerland? This is just Morocco or more tactically switched on. I think that yes, but also I feel it's also a sense of expectation, and that's what makes me appreciate. Messi and Ronaldo even more because that expectation to perform week in, week out at the highest level is something that I think, you know, in terms of modern football, not many people have been as consistent as, as they have been in history. So it's something where, yeah, he, he at a, you know, coming on first kind of real starts, scoring a hat trick. To move on from that and you know build on that, it's a you know monumental feat. And, and like as the panel has said as well, credit to Morocco, they were very very disciplined at the back, very organized. Everyone knowing what like their role is, playing into the T. So that that you know does sort of you know pose a different threat for them, you know, or different challenge for the Portuguese team. So unfortunately, they weren't able to crack on the day. And I think barring a goalkeeper error, that game could easily have gone to penalties as well. And, you know, like uh, would have been else. another deal biter. Yeah. Yeah. Like my opinion on Portugal and Cristiano Ronaldo is that I feel for Ronaldo, he's been unlucky to be a born to be born 10 years later than he did. Because I feel he was 10 years younger and he got to play with the Portugal team of Luis Vigo, Ronaldo in his prime. I'm sorry, Luis Vigo, Rui Costa in Ronaldo's prime. Charisma, I feel maybe yeah. he would have a charisma as well. Maybe he would have gotten closer to that World Cup. But he's uh, he's been such a remarkable servant uh, for world football, and it's um it was kind of sad seeing him go out in tears. But I do feel Portugal they have a bright future in the players that are coming through the Portuguese league and are playing in big teams like Manchester City and stuff. So oh. the future is there for Portugal. And we're going to go and talk about the other Portuguese-speaking team. Uh, we can talk about Brazil and the Kyle. What went wrong with Brazil? Yeah, it's uh, the favorites are out, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I think they were, this might sound very simplistic, but I think they were relatively unlucky. Um, I th- just the sheer amount of chances they created, some... No, they didn't really test, or uh, I should know. Um, Livka Kovic was made some pretty good um, saves, but when you only concede one goal, and that like one shot, pardon me, on target, and that shot is, you know, in the second period of extra time, and it's a deflected shot that goes in, yeah. bit hard done, but in terms. There were just little things I thought, like Neymar's sharpness throughout the course of the game, you know, some of his decision making where it's like he could have played Vinicius in for a better shot opportunity. You consider that um Lucas Paqueta had two really good chances. Neymar also had two really good chances off the left side in the, the second half. Just little things like that not going their way, I think ultimately makes things difficult. Really, but you mentioned last um, on the last podcast, though, that this will be a game more in the uh, competitive edge that we saw with against the Switzerland or Serbia, as opposed to what we, you know, the thrashing that we saw against South Korea, where it's very cagey for the most part. It's hard to break a team down, but. Yeah. Um, it- yeah, it, I think just all in all, it just wasn't quite as sharp a performance as they would have liked. 
ultimately the pressing was not again to the the same mold against South Korea, but the other end of the this is that they're playing against a very very good team. Yeah, they they really are, and as you can see from the stats, it's like Brazil had two point five five expected goals, Croatia had zero point six three, so. Brazil clearly created chances, enough chances to win this game by not just one, but maybe two or three goals. And the goal that Neymar scored was beautifully made. But it's oh, yeah, that was that, gorgeous. <laughs> and after that goal, it just seems like they didn't do what Brazil should have done, given how they performed in the group stage, given how clo- how defensively strong they were and just closing mm-hmm. out that game. And after they were... the goal, yeah, I, I expected Brazil to just close it out. Yeah, in the after their goal, they seem to be in a bit of a limbo sort of stage of do we continue to press up a bit? Should we sit back a bit? Even five minutes to go, there's um in the um on the telecast, like Chiche is clearly like telling certain players in the middle to kind of drop back a bit, and it's just like yeah, like almost. Uh, everyone almost like wasn't on the same sort of page but for the croatia goal like i i kind of i don't know if any um if anyone recalls this but the ball that wins croatia back is an absolutely astonishingly time tackle by guardiol on freddy when fred is almost he's ahead of the ball but guardiol makes a sliding challenge that is just perfectly timed where they're able, Lovren's able to get the ball in just a series of typical uh, typical Croatia sort of movements and a cross in. Gets them a very good scoring opportunity, which they took advantage of. Yeah, and, and this the centre-back Gravio is, is much speculated as he's going to be the next big centre-back. People are saying he might go for 100 million. Lots of top, top European clubs. He's been astounding this turn. Yeah. yeah, he really is a good player. Yeah. But going back to Brazil, Chiche announced that he's leaving the Brazilian national team after this. How would you sum up his legacy? Because in South America, Brazil had been absolutely the best, and it seems like they're the team to beat there. But whenever they've come to the World Cup stage against big opposition like Belgium or top European opposition like Croatia, they've just fallen short. Yeah, I mean, Oscar mentioned last time as well, it's... Every time they've met a European opposition since 2002, the first time they meet them on the knockout stage, then they always lose, which is staggering. But for Chichi, yep, same thing, quarterfinals last time where they couldn't get it, couldn't cross the finish line against the Netherlands. Um, yeah, it's difficult because in Brazil, losing, given their expectations, it's almost like a national travesty in a way. Yeah. So Chichi, in this case, seems to be the fellow that is attracting the, you know, that is playing the scapegoat sort of figure. Some of the decision makings, I guess. But all in all, I mean, he's essentially created a much more sort of progressive way of playing than they had been for a good 10 years prior, where it was reliance on the counterattack, essentially. So... Yeah. Is that because of the talent that they have? Because going back to 2014 World Cup, they didn't have the same attacking talent as they do right now in that there was Neymar and 10 others in terms of creating because the strike force was Joe and Fred. But now mm-hmm. you have Vinicius, you have Deborah Jesus, you have so many attackers at the moment. Mm-hmm. Not to mention you know, Rodrigo and Anthony you, and you Anthony, could just yeah. put into a game, right? Rafinha yeah, as well. Gabriel Jesus didn't even make the lineup, uh, mm-hmm. make the squad because he's injured. Or he he made the squad. Yeah, he's injured, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one thing we've seen with this Brazil team, this sort of um, lack of reliance on just getting Neymar the ball and kind of hoping he can just create chances, which, you know, he obviously just does anyway. But to have world-class players or a world-class player in Vinicius and just very, very good players around that as well. Yeah. It's part of the reason that this Brazil team has, you know, been the favorites up until this point. So okay. it's hard to say moving forward though, because there's no clear cut coach in line. Sure. So it'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he signed a, a signed a two year 
deal with City recently. So, I mean, it, down the line, I wouldn't be surprised. But, yeah, yeah it'll be interesting to see what um, some of the decisions, even with Neymar, essentially. Is he going to continue with the Brazil national team? Despite yeah. saying, coming out earlier this year, saying this might be his last World Cup and so on and so forth. Yeah, I really hope he does. I really hope he does. Uh, going on to Croatia, Oscar, how do Croatia keep on doing this? They get to the they get to extra time in all their World Cup knockout stages, and somehow they come out on top. Yeah, wow. it's, I don't know how honestly <laughs> these guys are the most slept on team in the history of the World Cup. Like nobody, yeah. nobody gave them like I don't think many people at Croatia in the last four following like during the World Cup predictions, but they've done it. They, it's in his damn midfield, right? He's so good that you could make a case it's arguably better than Brazil's midfield. You could make it. You could make a case. Because Brazil's midfield in this tournament was just Casemiro. It was five forwards, Casemiro, and then four defenders. But yeah, like the way Modric and Co were able to, you know, just, they didn't trade, like we said, they clearly didn't threaten Brazil too much, but they made sure they weren't under pressure for huge amounts of times. They kept the ball well. The plan worked into absolute perfection. And when they needed to get that response, they were able to get it. Like Mikhail said, that tackle to start it off from Gradio was absolutely excellent. You know, he's also, he's arguably been one of the best defenders in this tournament. You know, that combined with, like you said, the midfield and the overall experience of this team, because it's virtually the same team from 2018 minus Rakitic and Mandzukic. So, yeah, all these teams put together, and you can't really be too surprised that they're in the semi final again. Yeah, that's always a bit surprised uh, with the reaction here in Canada when we got Belgium, Croatia, and Morocco, and people were like, oh, it's just Croatia. And I'm like, Croatia, we're in the World Cup final last time. They still have a stack. That, that, that's, that's a weird reaction, but... Yeah. Yeah. It's even more impressive this time because last time the hardest team they beat was England in the semi-final. No disrespect to Denmark and Russia, of course, but, <laughs> you know, they're not as strong as Brazil, for instance. No. So, not. yeah. Yes, <laughs> there's been some luck on the way, like in that Belgium game, you know, but... Yeah. They fully deserve to be here. Yeah, they, they fully do. And let's talk about Luka Modric because the guy's 38. Like, I don't get it. It's almost like a Benjamin Button football reboot because each year it gets older and you expect the drop off, but the drop off never comes. Yeah. Uh, is when I talk about Modric, I always tell people like football development on form is not linear. Like, people, different people have their time, and like you said. Modric, while he got into things late, he's been absolutely phenomenal for work club and country. Like, he's the face of this Croatian golden generation, this Croatian super team, as Twitter called them. <laughs> yeah, so it's really incredible what they've done, you know. And, yeah, it's, yeah. It's something I hope will end on Tuesday, though, but it's still great to see. <laughs> yeah, true. I, I remember uh, before the World Cup started, we were discussing this off air and we were talking about Modric, and there was a quote from him that said, if Croatia wins the World Cup, he's going to retire, and I joked that <laughs> that means he's not going to retire. <laughs> but it seems like maybe there's a chance. <laughs> well, there's a chance at this point. This World Cup, I'm calling it the 50-50 World Cup. There's no, there's no bigger country or smaller country here, like, he said, yeah. we can easily have the Croatia-Morocco final as easily as we can have Argentina-France final. So, yeah. yeah, it's been interesting to see what happens. Yeah, and, and Mikhail, just a word on Canada, because Canada, the way put in with this Croatia and Morocco super team, and how good is their World Cup in hindsight, given what we saw with, what we've seen with Croatia and Morocco and how they played against Belgium? Uh, well, and their for performance in the first half of Belgium, still, I mean, despite the fact that they con conceded a goal, that I mean, uh, that first half, they might have been 
the, that might have been one of the best performances along with like Brazil, South Korea, had they been able to just finish a chance essentially. But yeah, I mean, in hindsight, it that's clearly like the toughest group. <laughs> so yeah, they should be, you know, very, very proud of their performances there. Um, the Croatia game kind of was more of a learning curve, I think, for them, though. Yeah. Just a little bit vulnerable defensively um, on the counter, essentially. But again, that's a learning curve for four years time when they're hosting it, though. I think they, they could give they could they could have a pretty successful knockout stage run with the talent they have. It's just a matter of continuing to progress, essentially. Yeah, and as this World Cup is proved, anything is possible. I'm going to go back to Oscar because his boy Messi was on fire as Argentina played against Netherlands. Even now, Molina scored thanks to Messi. That, that's something that I didn't expect. Yeah. But you, you expected Argentina once it was 2-0, like Brazil, to like just like see the game now, let things go. But our boy, our favorite boy, Mateo Lajos, he had different ideas for, for this Argentina team. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes of extra time, <laughs> lots of chaos. The reason why we love him. <laughs> yeah. That game, right? If you know Mateo Lajos, you'll just laugh and be like, God, this is what we're expecting. If you don't know him, you're absolutely confused, <laughs> angry, or just... You just want to give up and stop watching <laughs> the game, <laughs> depending on how stressed you are. Because, yeah, well, Mateo Lajos' games, if not for anything, they're always fun to watch. It also helps, like, the history between Netherlands and Argentina in past World Cups, in the present, with all the beef going on. That's made for probably the best game so far. Yeah, like, in this game, bad. this game had everything. It was very bad tempered, even in celebrations, like the celebration for Messi after the goal to leave and how uh, no yeah. one saw in the penalties. Yeah, every, everyone just lost, everyone was just overcome with emotion. <laughs> to be honest, I like seeing that kind of thing. Like, it's better than, like, you know, boring, more boring games where they're like, oh, just going through the emotions, saying nice stuff about each other. Like, sometimes this passion and losing of heads is box office and it's what makes it's what makes a lot of us love football yeah it definitely it definitely is and speaking of argentina they started this game very well they were pressurizing netherlands and why did they change tactics after they scored two goals because it seemed from that they allowed netherlands to come back into the game yeah i don't think it was down to argentina change it was more netherlands changing what they were doing and that change was absolutely drastic <laughs> yeah, they went from, you know, 5 3 2, I believe, to standard 4 4 2 with two, six foot four, and six foot six, six forwards. And the objective was simple crosses, crosses, crosses. And yeah, I feel like the change came from Netherlands as against Argentina. Yeah, and Val Vergost, what a game. <laughs> Yeah. Like if any, if there was any unlikely hero in this game, like none of us would have suspected that he would have been such a protagonist. Uh, I saw a tweet which said, "You wouldn't have imagined a player, the player to possibly end Messi's World Cup career, being a Burnley flop." <laughs> <laughs> and like respect him, respect him more than that. He was really good in Bundesliga for Wolfsburg, and he had two really well taken goals. The second goal, the uh, the genius from that set piece was just yeah. If Netherlands had won that game, that goal would have been like a goal we'll talk about for years and years and years. Especially the timing of it, because it's just the last minute of play mm -hmm. that's going on. Yeah. And you just think to be that intelligent, to think through that, mm -hmm. and just execute it, that's perfection. That was beautiful. Yeah. Because they had tried to go direct before from a similar place, and then no one thought they'd do that. And... I, was, I don't. I think I might be remembering wrong, but I don't know why Argentina didn't put someone on the ground to prevent that. So. Oh, they, they, they did. They did. They did. Oh yeah, they did. They did. It, it so, just yeah, that, that, that just makes this goal even better. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing about this game and how dramatic is what it was. Even after Netherlands came back and from two zero two two, Enzo Fernandez has a chance and hits the bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Enzo Fernandez has a couple of chances that, like you said, hit the bar and got deflected narrowly wide. Lautaro Martinez had a good couple of chances that Norbert was equal to and Van Dijk made the blocking. 
And Netherlands, although they didn't contribute too much in extra time, they had some dangerous counter attacks that ended in maybe poor play. So, yeah, yeah it was an overall thrilling game from start to end. And the penalty shootout was the Martinez show to Martinez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he was, uh, he did similar things to what he did in the Copa America. <laughs> so I lost, I lost my voice because of, <laughs> yeah, because I was like, the trend I've noticed with World Cup games is that the team that equalizes going into penalties or the team that's the underdog has won the penalty shootout. So given <laughs> that Argentina are the ones playing like they desperately didn't want this, I was worried. But, you know, when you have a reliable goalkeeper like Dibu Martinez, who is really really good at getting into players heads it yeah. helps it, it really does and i'm super happy for lautaro martinez who scored mm-hmm. the winning penalty because the body has been going through people are already calling him like the next Higuain, Higuain and, region yeah. <laughs> but he, he really like that goal like would serve him a lot for his confidence going into exactly. the, the tournament exactly like i was really worried for him because like you had norpert trying to play mind games with him you had Netherlands players trying to mess him up as you're going, even his teammates for club Dumfries. That just shows you how much this means to everybody. Like, I don't care if we're friends at club level. Like, yeah, words we can't say on this podcast, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was really, really good and important for Lautaro to get that winning penalty. And yeah. yes, let's see how he continues. Yeah, and um, Mikhail, how do you see Croatia getting one over this Argentina team? Yeah, so I would actually, I I think Argentina, by how they started this game, makes things a bit hard for Dalish to prepare for them. Because they, they moved to a back five, which I, I, I was actually going to interrupt you guys to ask, ask Oscar what the reason for that was, or if that like psyched out Van Gaal's tactics or whatnot. But in yeah. terms of preparation, I think that's difficult. It's like, do you prepare for a back four now or a back five again? I don't know. Yeah, I feel why they switched to a back five besides wanting more defensive solidity was Netherlands always play with two forwards. In some cases, three, but for the most part, two. And they just wanted that 3v2 when they're playing out from the back. So I I think that was the reason. Okay. I mean, big call. It it worked for them. It's just, I was just very surprised by that. Yeah. But yeah, Croatia, I think it's essentially what Oscar said earlier where they probably do have the best midfield in the entire competition. So maybe it's kind of reliance more on just maintaining the ball and creating chances from there. Uh, But yeah, they should fancy themselves. I mean, Argentina, this is... I think they played well this game. Am I right in saying it was maybe their best performance outside of you know those last 10 minutes where they were <laughs> on the back foot they seemed organized i guess yeah. like more so than they have in prior games i'll, I'll say the one against poland is probably the best performance because they just but yeah they, i, but I mean was I, poland yeah, yeah i thought was poland were just yeah. essentially trying not to <laughs> accumulate yeah. another yellow card in a way <laughs> yeah. yeah i feel yeah. like the last 10 minutes was just down to the extreme height disadvantage because the tallest Argentina center back is probably Romero with six foot. Otamendi and Nicola and um, Lissandro aren't very tall. So I feel like that the the fact that they managed to hold on for that 10 minutes with that disadvantage is astonishing. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I feel like against Croatia they'll play back four because Croatia always play one striker and like you said that midfield they they're going to need all the help they can get to battle that and Messi will as usual yeah. drop in to try and make it in four versus three. So yeah, yeah the tactical battle in that Croatia game will be absolutely fascinating. It will be fascinating. It'll it'll also be interesting to see if Di Maria is healthy mm-hmm. because his sort of mercurial sort of creativeness mm-hmm. is something that I think Argentina will need in um this game and perhaps in the final if they're able to cross the finish line. Yeah, yeah. I think if he's if De Maria is fit, he starts because even before the Netherlands, I was hearing that he's not really ready. But the fact that he showed up for this game for some minutes is a good sign. Mm-hmm. 
it really is a good center. And this game, Croatia Argentina, it has lots of history because this is where Messi scores his first goal for Argentina. I think this also the game where Modric has his first start for Croatia. And let's not forget they played in the last World Cup and Croatia really dismantled Argentina then. <laughs> but then maybe there were some people who say Argentina didn't really have a coach at that point. <laughs> or a goalkeeper. Like <laughs> that Caballero mistake still haunts me to this day. That's why <laughs> I am thankful for Emiliano Martinez. Yeah. You know, maybe Re comes in and... <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, look, look. yeah let's, let's talk about the last... Uh, quarterfinal we saw, that was the big one between England and France. And Vumi, I'm going to ask you again, start with you. It seems England really played well in this one, but they just couldn't get it over the line. What went wrong for them? I think there were definitely some questionable referee decisions on the day. Especially that first goal for uh, France should not have happened. Uh, Saka was fouled, you know, at the on the edge of the box. I don't understand how it seems like Upper Meccano was trying to his best, like, what's the, like, roughest defender you can think of, like, from back in the day. He was trying his best to, like, break Pepe? the defender. Pepe. <laughs> well, Pepe. Yeah, Pepe, like, it's got to be Pepe. Pepe. Pepe yeah, yeah, Pepe in his, in his heyday, right? Like, where he just kind of comes through players. He, he was doing his very best. And it was, I really thought he would have, you know, given them a lot more chances, like, you know, like, England going forward. So, you know, that first goal should have counted. Unfortunately, I think VAR doesn't go... I, I can't remember why maybe it couldn't go that far back. You know, maybe like there's, there's a certain amount of time that had passed between the supposed foul and them scoring the goal or whatever. But Yeah, I, I think with VAR, it's like if the ball, if the play changes, for example, let's say there's a foul, but like England collects it back, then France collects it back, then the play is invalid. So... Can't uh, yeah. Okay, fair enough. But I mean, again, credit to credit to the French team. Um, England. I mean, on the day, Saka was their best player. Um, you know, the most threatening when giving the chance to you know like have the ball at his feet and everything. You know, he won them the penalty at the first uh, stage, and I think as well, yeah, the French like backline. I, I hope like Didier Deschamps like you know. Like screamed at Upamecano and Hernandez because that that challenge he did in the box was so unnecessary. It's just yeah. and you know in my mind I was like okay if England England were the only team I thought could beat France you know and like help it easier for Portugal obviously Morocco <laughs> had different ideas but uh, yeah I think the midfield for um, England were relatively subdued um again it, it seemed more like okay get the ball to Saka. Saka's like you know feet and he was able to sort of move players around and make something happen to some degree um you know i think definitely taking him off wasn't the best decision especially like bringing on sterling i just feel he hasn't he hasn't shown enough especially if this tournament to warrant him being brought on. I can I can understand Marcus Rashford, you know, coming on for Foden, you know, different like, you know, um, attacking dynamic. But yeah, on the day, um, you know, a couple of good saves as well, like Pickford, you know, he did play well. Um that could have easily gone to you know, extra time as well. Mbappe was relatively substitute. It was fun to see him and Kyle Walker run. And I think I mentioned in the last podcast was like, I know Kyle Walker would stick to him like glue or try yeah. to stick to him like glue as much as possible. So he was relatively subdued for the night. So, um, you know, to somebody like with his best Pogba and pressure with the goal, <laughs> it was uh, it was a very kind of, you know, uh, big game, heavily contested, I think. The referee decision a couple of ways you know if you know um kind of swung the match in some ways but credit to france you know jury as well always underrated and so it was always taken from granted in many ways got the critical goal for them so they deserved it i would say on the balance of play yeah and i'm gonna say a couple of points with england first of all i'm gonna defend Ryan sterling because he's not at the best of time personally um, he had to True. go back to England True. during the World Cup because of what happened to his house, which got invaded. 
Um, I also feel with them, uh, Rashford, he had a really good chance towards the end to send it to extra time with that free kick. You sometimes forget how good he is with free kicks, Rashford. Mm-hmm. But there's an elephant in the room we haven't spoken about, and that's Harry Kane, who had that penalty mm-hmm. that should have changed the complexion of the game. I mean, 100%, but it's like there's no other English player that you would <laughs> Put your money on to put dispatch that penalty away, right? So it's kind of more like you know, like live by the sword, die by the sword, kind of thing. And unfortunately, yeah. I wouldn't have expected him to blaze over the bar. I think he's a he's a he's such a pure striker of the ball, and he's always sort of so precise when striking the ball that you ex- at least expect him to get some targets, at least give the keeper a chance to you know, make a save and be get the rebound or something like that, but. It's just a shame. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't think, yeah, they did enough to really sort of win the game. I mean, they had chances mostly from France, you know, French mistakes in terms of. Yeah. Really the really French had that chance where it's like one on, like, it's not one on one, but like it's a clear opportunity and that just goes slightly wide from, from him. Uh, yeah. Do you feel it was a mistake for Kane to take that panel, second penalty, given that? He is teammate to Hugo Lloris, who he possibly done tons of training with. Maybe a second, a different pound sticker at that point might have been wiser from England. To be honest, I nah. There's just is he's Harry Kane. I mean, you know, he went level with Rooney with that penalty, the first one. So the opportunity to go ahead of Rooney and be the all-time goal scorer for England was there for the taking. So I, I yeah. And he, he went the same way as well. Just, you know, if he kept it down, he scores because the placement was too high for the keeper. But unfortunately, um, he didn't. And, uh, yeah, I would say he was still the best player for the job um, to take yeah. that penalty, in my opinion, though. Yeah. yeah. And Makar, from a French perspective, France, they didn't really show up in this game, as you can see the stats. Like, they were beaten in expected goals and shots and targets and big chances created in possession. But yet, they still win. Yeah, they pretty much lost the battle in every major statistic. Um, yeah, they. I thought they were quite lucky to win this game. Um, a lot of favorable calls that affected the game. Um, Lumi's already mentioned the Saka being fouled by Opamecano that led to the Chumani goal. And then obviously another penalty decision. Um, but that's the thing, like even some of these decisions, I I was curious why Saka was taken off because he was the most dangerous player, but it's almost like he was like hurting by the end. Um but sorry, from a, a French perspective, um yeah, essentially it's just they really just got the job done by moments of brilliance from um Chumani's goal was sensational essentially just not no run up to the ball ability to kind of just just bend it a little bit fortunate to get it through Bellingham's legs um and then the Griezmann cross in the second half was very very impressive as well yeah but yeah tactically I mean England were prepared not only prepared for um um Mbappe but they essentially were attacking that right-hand side with Saka and Henderson drifting, where Walker essentially just kind of stayed. But the main element of this French team, I think, is just how efficient they are at taking chances, the chances that are given to them. They're able to be clinical, and chances, essentially they're able to create a lot of good chances as well, which is something that's extremely impressive. Yeah, it really is. And and Antoine Griezmann became the top assistant in French history and mm-hmm. you've been very high on him on this tournament and did he extremely yeah I mean he's also leading um I think expected assists as well by like it's like something it's by like one assist more than like the person in second place I think last I saw which yeah. is astounding but yeah he he's I mean the first half he was uh along with Saka just clearly the best player on the field I thought just ability to drift, essentially, you know, roam and drift in positions. 
is something that's just so underrated in this game, particularly now when like you you know teams rely a lot on like collective structures and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was he was incredible, and will be highly important, extremely important in this Morocco game. Who are just so solid defensively. <laughs> how how do you see that game going? Like, do you think Morocco, given the fact that we've mentioned that France they didn't really show up in this game, do you think Morocco can take advantage of? France's lack of discipline, or will France just do the same thing? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I am. I have no idea, to be completely honest. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just purely with just like Morocco. I mean, it was mentioned earlier that the only goal they conceded is an own goal, essentially, and they're just so solid defensively. But then you look at this French team, right? It's Mbappe, like Giroud. Dembele, like, it's stacked. But, yeah, I think from a Morocco perspective, though, it's mostly, I think, with um, what we saw in this England game, perhaps they might take something from that by attacking Teo Hernandez, who is a very, very good left back, but defensively is a little bit vulnerable. And Rabio is also predominantly on that left-hand side. That might be a clear point to attack with, um, um, goodness me, his name is escaped. Hakimi. Uh, yes. Hakimi and Ziyech. With Hakimi and um, Ziyech as well. Yeah. That might be an area that they can just clearly exploit. But they've been so good with essentially the structure they've kept for the most part of springing with multiple areas, right? Yeah. That left side of France looks very enticing and very wrecked for Morocco because Mbappe is there, Rabiot is mm-hmm. there, and then there's Teo Hernandez. And those are players who don't really know how to defend, and they're coming up against Hakimi and Ziyech. I don't know. Maybe Morocco has... They, they have some joy down that side, as you said. But yeah, I other, think so. But, yeah... I, I, sorry, Oscar? I, I was going to say, on the opposite end, Hakimi <laughs> might be restricted because leaving Mbappe alone is a problem. Because if you don't damage Tio enough, Mbappe has no one to stop him. So, I feel yeah. that it's like uh, going to be an interesting battle. Yeah. And Mbappe, yeah, no, that that's well. that's a very good point. I think I think in a way it might actually benefit them if Hakimi kind of stays at home. Um more so than he's done throughout the course of the tournament. Just Mbappe is just so good. I think between Ziek and Unahi, they can do yep. something to yes, Rabiu enough. and um too. Yeah, and, he's, and he's, he's had a really there? good tournament as well. Unahi, mm-hmm. or what's his name again? The number eight, right? Yeah, Unahi. 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 I remember yeah. him because <laughs> his shooting against Portugal also made me lose my voice. Yeah, that, no, that's what that's what Luis Enrique said. Like post game, he didn't. You referred to him as who's that player? <laughs> Which I just yeah. thought to be somewhat funny. Yeah, Unahi yeah. and Amarbet have been exceptional in this tournament. Yeah. Yeah. For France, would you move Kunde back to the center back position? Given uh, what was the move for Mikano? No. I think he's Pavard, best... Pavard, no. No. I think he's yeah, he's <laughs> clear. It's it's just sort of the Barcelona issue, right? Where he's like their best right back possible and he's also one of the best center backs possible. Back possible. Yeah. yeah. Um I mean if I wouldn't be surprised though with the game Kubekano had that maybe Konate might be back in the squad, perhaps. Okay. I mean, Deschamps is not afraid to do that as well. That's part of the reason Pavard was dropped after one of the group stage games, first game maybe yeah, for Australia. Kanate yeah. or for um, Kunde, pardon me. Yeah. And so, guys, it's prediction time. No, who's going to win both games, and who's going to be champion? <laughs> You'd have to be insanely brave to predict now. <laughs> After I know, I know. I think, I think yeah. I'm one for four in the last. I was four yeah. for okay. I was four for four in the last round in terms of what I wanted to happen, not in terms of predictions. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I was zero for four. Should I play what I predicted last round? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna play it. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. Hmm? 
Are you playing it right now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't think you can hear. I right thought now. we were going to hear it. Yeah. So I, I just played my predictions, which is Brazil to win, hmm? Netherlands to win, <laughs> England to win, and Portugal to win. <laughs> Taj, we need you now. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Croatia and France to win. <laughs> oh man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for <laughs> for French fans and Argentina what a, what fans. <laughs> but Argentina is going to win. I feel oh, no. France is going to win. The final is going to be between France and Argentina. No. And I've changed my mind. <laughs> sorry, Argentina fans. Argentina is going to win the World Cup. <laughs> <It's over. laughs> oh, God. oh man, Oscar, what are your thoughts? What are my thoughts are uh... okay. I can see Argentina getting past Croatia if he gets the penalties because of my no Livaco. Oh God, <laughs> uh, this is this is a tough one because this game has extra time written all over it for sure. <laughs> Just like the Netherlands Argentina game. So I'll say Argentina will just get it done in extra time again. And then Morocco versus France. Uh, yeah. I'm going to say Morocco win. I'll say it to my chest. So that if they do win, I'll look right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Morocco and then some an Argentina Morocco final. And who's going to take it? Bono? <laughs> Bono knows Messi. That's with my chest, Argentina. <laughs> Argentina. Yeah. And Macau. Um, I think Argentina will scrap just by Croatia, and then I'm. I think France will beat Morocco. Morocco. And who's going to take it? Um, oof. <laughs> I, I think Argentina will take Argentina that. Take it. Right. Ah, let's see. So we have two Argentinas to go. Lumi must be sweating right now. <laughs> but with the prospect of Messi lifting <laughs> that trophy. <laughs> I am... Um... I'm one step away from depression. Just you know, the, the thoughts of him just uh, going because anything but France for me, you know, I don't see it as a um, positive outcome. Like, not no, I don't think. Come on, Morocco winning there will be a positive outcome. No, no, no. So I mean, like, um, in terms of stopping Messi from winning it, uh, like I feel I see France as the only team, but. <laughs> Just after what Oscar said now, I don't know why. And I'm just looking. It could be the greatest World Cup win ever if Morocco go through and win everything. Like, it could be literally the greatest, like, the hardest route of any sort of undersized team ever, just or underdog team. And I'm not saying undersized, but underdog team to go through and perform because no one has given them an inch and they've taken that, like, and that and more. It's just sort of pushing on and yeah. okay, all that to say. Um yeah, let me let me say it in my chest. <laughs> um, I just have to win an extra time. Um and uh for us to win an extra time as well. Both teams to win an extra time and then France to win in 90 minutes. Nice. To win. Final. Nice. So we have like three Argentina, one France. And then speaking of Morocco, just going back in, if they do win it, like, do you think this would be bigger than, I guess it's the World Cup, so there's an element of duh. It's bigger than what Greece did in 2004. But I think that would be the only similar um, parallel to what Morocco is doing right now. Because Greece in the year 2004, they had Portugal and Spain in the group. They went past that. I believe they beat France in the quarterfinals or something, or then they beat Czech Republic in the semifinals. And I know everyone's like, oh, Czech Republic, like they're not a big football nation. But back then, they had like tons of great players. They had Nadia. So it's similar to Croatia right now. 
and in the final they beat Portugal in home soil. So, which one do you think guys think will be a much bigger achievement, Morocco's or Greece's? Morocco for sure. Morocco because um, they were also like, in a very difficult group too. True. True. Because the Greek like argument would be like they had Portugal and Spain in their group, and Portugal were hosts, and they beat Portugal uh, twice. God damn. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm going to see Morocco because the World Cup yeah. is, and they'd be the first African team to ever win it too. So there's that yeah. team too. And just like the the caliber of teams they've had to go through, like yeah. especially now to beating the you know like the former world champions, right? Like yeah. in the semifinals, like and then going on to win it, it would be, I think, yeah, the greatest. You know, like probably. Second to, um, or maybe on the same level more, depending on how you look at it. Leicester winning the Premier League when they won it, when they did something yeah. similar, like like footballing feet. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, I guess even Porto with the Champions League, but the thing is, Porto's path was a bit less tricky, to be honest, in that year. Yeah, yeah. Mikhail, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I. I think even what they managed to accomplish already, just being the first sort of African Arab side to make the semifinals is extremely impressive in this day and age, in particular, where it's just a clear-cut European, um, South American, like, hegemony for those uh, final four. I mean, I... Gosh, if they beat France, even just to get to the finals, that'll be something else. <laughs> yeah, they're going to have to declare one week holiday in Morocco. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I mean, uh, well, another thing we... Sorry, Oscar, we didn't mention as well is they... they This is a home game to them with their support, which is... I don't know how, like, intangibles works, per se, in terms of, um, like, how the effect of home support is for a team but this i mean it's it's got to play some sort of role here yeah i I would agree with that and also like in terms of like soccer is a game of small details and we're discussing with that england game about how the decisions went against them and if you're the home crowd there's a tendency for the ref to give you better calls calls going your way and that could also help them against france too in that the small fouls might go in their favor yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. And Oscar, to wrap it up? I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. sorry no. no, it's okay. It's okay, yeah. Okay. I know I picked Morocco, but that's more speaking with what I want to happen. But in any case, <laughs> I feel like most of these beautiful underdog stories tend to end in the semifinal because, yeah. like we said, the changes the back for I know the deputies have done well but okay I'm going to use the words of my brother who was really angry after they won if they fall apart against France and France win like pretty easily it's just going to be sad like the whole journey ended that way yeah but you know maybe the real World Cup is the friends we made along the way sure sure sure. like like, you're you're right though because we saw what happened going back to the Champions League with Ajax where they fell away in the semi-finals. Monaco a couple of years ago. Vietnam Denmark. This year, Denmark. So, there's a pattern. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a pattern. <laughs> so it, 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 it could be possible, but you know what? But then, I, yeah, the team that beat the underdog lost in the final, so... <laughs> 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 Juventus against Monaco. Sure. England against Italy, yeah. Liverpool against Villarreal. Can I go on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. But this World Cup has been full of surprises. And we sure mm-hmm. hope here in La Cancha that it surprises us again. And thanks for listening. And hopefully you'll be listening again in the semifinals where you never know, we might discuss in the Croatia Morocco final. Oh, I've, already drank, I've already drank them. So <laughs> it's not going to happen. Adios, guys. Ciao.